Thank you, everybody. I brought along a PowerPoint because I want you to see what this pet coke is. And pet coke is short for petroleum coke. Petroleum coke is a byproduct or it's a waste left over from the tar sands that are being refined just across the border in Whiting, Indiana at the BP uh, refinery over there in Whiting. The BP plant has just completed a $3.8 billion um, improvement over there. Uh, it's the largest industrial investment ever done in the state of Indiana. And that was in anticipation of refining tar sands coming down from Alberta, Canada. The tar sands, if you're not familiar, I think probably a lot of you are, the tar sands is one of the most hideous things that you've ever seen, the way that they're scraping the earth. It's comparable to if you've seen like the mountaintop removing in Appalachia where they're coal mining and just stripping the tops of mountains away, changing entire landscapes, changing entire uh, uh, traditions and, and uh, ways of life for people, polluting rivers, polluting lakes. The very same thing is happening up in Canada including uh, kicking indigenous people off of their lands that they've been on for, for uh, thousands of years, um, and destroying fish, wildlife, uh, human life, and the uh, entire landscape. This slideshow was kind of developed for, uh, it was at Gage Park High School, we were invited to go out because the students saw the front page article in the uh, Tribune and this teacher at Gage Park said he wanted his, uh, his classes to get involved in a local important issue, a social uh, issue of the Chicagoland area and he, he selected this because it has an environmental aspect and it has uh, the little um, Dave is fighting Goliath, and uh, out on the southeast side, our organization, uh, we've taken on some pretty big Goliaths uh, so far and been victorious in some cases in getting a landfill moratorium uh, and uh, beating back the uh, Chicago Police Department who endeavored to have a, uh, you might remember a couple years ago I came before you, uh, they wanted to build a, a firing range in the middle of a, a secluded area that um, was kind of set off to the side and supposed to be green space for, for uh, birds and, and uh, fish and wildlife and stuff. And um, the biggest, probably one of the bigger uh, challenges that we took on was the Lucadia plant, which was going to be a coal gasification plant. And it was going to be built on the uh, right where uh, Republic Steel used to have its old coke plant. And that's practically where uh, we're beginning to get dumped on, uh, on for with this pet coke that's coming out of the um, refineries at BP. Probably a lot of you know about the southeast side of Chicago. At one time we had steel mills, Wisconsin Steel, where my father worked for about 30 some years, Republic Steel, Interlake Steel, Youngstown Sheet and Tube, which became U.S. Steel, uh, Carnegie, and so forth, and a few other ones. Uh, well, they're all gone today. Yeah, this, this is a picture of uh, Wisconsin Steel and the Calumet River. Wisconsin Steel on one side and on the other side is uh, part of Acme uh, and Interlake Steel. So you saw that, you see here that they um, naturally developed along the river for a number of reasons. One major one was transportation, but also that they use the water for uh, in the industry and the steel making process. They use it both to intake and to release uh, water into. So the Calumet River has been a hard working river. It's, uh, it's not your pretty type of river. It's an industrial river and a pretty interesting place with a lot of barge traffic and uh, industry along, along it. But all the steel is gone today. Okay. Just, just to give me an idea, when we have to, and this was a landfill battle, there's me, you can tell by the bald head back there. Uh, but this was a, during a landfill fight. Um, sometimes we have to do that, and we're, and we're grateful to people that have come down and helped us out as we marched around. I know Joyce has done it several times, and some rest of you, when we have a big environmental uh, concerns would go down and protest at the state of Illinois. That last scene was at on the fifth floor of City Hall. Anyway, the pet coke. Back to the pet coke. This is it. And it looks a lot like coal. 
but it looks like uh, it's grittier than coal. It's small. It comes out of the refinery kind of like in a dusty pellet form, whereas coal is more like a rock. And we've had a lot of coal out in our area. We've had coal yards, and coal is used in the steel making industry, so we're accustomed to it. We put up with it over the years because the coal uh, was used in the steel mills, and our dads and our uncles and our brothers and ourselves, we all worked uh, about 70-some percent of the people on the southeast side at one time worked in the steel industry, so we, we had that trade-off. We didn't mind that trade-off so much because it was the jobs. When, when we saw the smoke coming out of the chimneys, that meant that uh, somebody was making money and guys were getting a payday out of it. Today we don't have those jobs, but they're still dumping on us, and this is the product. And this is one of the forms how it comes over. It comes over in barges, from uh, primarily in barges, but it also comes by rail, and it also comes by truck. So it's coming in three ways. When Once those cokers start spitting this stuff out, they have to get rid of it because Indiana, and get this, I know it'll come as a shock, India has tighter uh, restrictions on this pet coke than Illinois does. <laughs> Illinois hasn't, yes, right. It's an anomaly, but <clears throat> they... Uh, they require 40-foot wooden fences around it to contain that in Indiana, and they just can't do that at the BP refinery. So as soon as that stuff gets produced, they ship it over to Illinois, where there are no restrictions today. Uh, it's treated like a waste product, and they're, uh, they've been just storing it over there. And this, this uh, doesn't get used in Illinois because they can't burn it. It's too dirty. It's worse uh, burning than coal. It's more of a, a carbon content than coal. So in the United States, there is a national uh, law against burning this in its pure form. Some power plants still mix it a little bit with coal, but they can't burn it purely. But it is used in China, India, Brazil, and Mexico, and Canada, where the stuff begins its journey, and we'll talk about that in a little while. So this is a mountain. This is uh, how it looks when it's kind of neat, and they have a conveyor that uh, offloads it and, and stacks it alongside the river. And uh, you can see this is just big old uh, stones here, and uh, there is no retention on, on the uh, properties. This is, uh, by the way, I want to mention, this where this is located, it was owned, this is a little... Uh, test for you folks, and I know everybody's going to get it, but this is at the KCBX uh, facility, terminal, and the K stands for, who are the um, infamous brothers in this country? The Koch brothers. The Koch brothers, right. This is owned by the Koch brothers. They have two properties, one at 100th in the Calumet River, the other newer property that they just purchased from Detroit uh, Edison at 108th in the uh, river. They're moving their operation from one end to the other end. They're getting more out of the coal and more into this pet coke. And uh, this is just another picture. We're going to show a bunch of pictures how it gets piled high. It, they, it can reach up to five and six stories tall. And this is how it comes in. It's on a, a big barge here, and then it gets offloaded. It gets unloaded every time that bucket picks up and drops or picks up and moves, there's a puff of this stuff and it gets picked up by the wind and goes across. People live just a couple blocks away from here. All right, and this is another one. You can see the mountains of it. And this thing right here, uh, the, the uh, KCBX called us over for a community meeting. They were very proud to tell us that they spent $10 million on a suppression system to keep the dust down. So they installed this... Um, system of uh, watering. They call it a, a water cannon. And when the wind picks up these water cannons, or if the, uh, uh, if the air is very dry, there's no precipitation, these cannons shoot water all around, mixed with some kind of epoxy that's supposed to keep the stuff down. We don't even know about that epoxy, if that has any effects, because that gets blown around too. You can see a little bit better how these big granite uh, rocks are, are holding it in, but the problem is this stuff runs off too. The water, you know, in a heavy rain, it just goes into our streets, goes into our st sewer system. So we have the MWRD on them right now. Uh, we're partnering with the Alliance for Great Lakes. They're looking at, at uh, the water issue because this is connected, this is Calumet River connected to Lake Michigan at 92nd Street. 
and this is what it looks like in the river. It just coagulates around. It's like an oily slime, because inevitably, a lot of this stuff drops off during the loading and unloading process. And uh, this other stuff, this other crap, just kind of sticks to it. This picture kind of uh, brings back a memory for me, because we didn't realize early this summer, uh, actually it was around March, so it was late spring. We had kind of like an early summer this year. Uh, we were treated to a tour of um, a, that liquid asphalt plant that I mentioned, and they wanted to show us the improvements because we were getting odor complaints in the area, and they wanted to show us that they installed these huge fans that uh, would eliminate the odors as they were loading and unloading. And while we were out there, they were proud to show us where their... Um, their barge comes in and when we got out to that point we were treated to a site that we weren't accustomed to seeing we looked out across the river and what did we see we saw these huge mounds that you can't see from the other side and we didn't realize were there once we saw those we said what the heck is going on back there and we embarked on this campaign to uh, find out more about it finding out how much of it's uh, really coming in and to try to put a stop to it. So uh, this, is, this is what it looks like. And this is, the, the, I mean, imagine this goes on for almost 12 blocks, a mile and a half and about a half mile wide. So it's a big area of this stuff. Well, the worst part is, and you can see some of it here on the conveyor, the worst part is the dust particulates that we feel because this stuff, uh, we feel it needs more study for one thing because there aren't a whole lot of studies on, on the health, the harmful effects it would have. This occurred on August 30th of this year. We had one of those rare storms that day where we had um, first this violent wind followed by a big rain and this is what we saw from about a block and a half away from uh, the DTE, or uh, then it was called, it became KCBX, this dust storm, this horrific dust storm. And a young man named Anthony Martinez was visiting relatives on that block, and he shot this picture. We have some other photographs from a Little League field, which is about a block from here, where kids were sent scurrying away because of the uh, wind bringing this into their faces and into their bodies and, and uh, what they were breathing. So the health effects, obviously, um, well, we know that there are carcinogens, toxins in this, and, and uh, very unhealthy for, uh, on their skin and breathing. Um, we're waiting to hear back. We're, in fact, we asked the city council, Department of Public Health, or the city council to ask the Department of Public Health to give us a, 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 have an investigation on the health effects of this stuff. So um, also, we have other photos. I mean, imagine there was a, a family that had a backyard picnic going on, and um, they showed us a picture, and we have it in our archives, of a salad, a fruit salad, made with Cool Whip, you know, so it was white and pretty yellows and, and reds and stuff like that. And they all had to run inside their house. So the picnic ended because of this wind that came up and the dust that was blowing over and they snapped a picture of this fruit salad all speckled with black. So this is, uh, this is along the river again. This is uh, what it looks like after, you know, the, the, you saw the big piles and then it gets shipped out, goes out to the uh, big tankers and gets shipped over to uh, up to Canada and up to St. Lawrence and wherever it's gonna go to other countries. But we, we snapped this one too because you can see this cloud in here and the back of this, they were loading up trucks. And whenever they loaded up trucks, we were on the river, by the way. We were with uh, Elizabeth Brackett from Channel 11. Um, she came out with us and did a documentary. It was on Chicago Tonight about a month ago. And uh, we took this picture because every time that we could hear the truck being loaded, like they dropped uh, you know, a bucket into it, and it would uh, throw the dust up into the air like that. And here we see the uh, water cannons. Really, when a big wind comes up, the water cannons are ineffectual because the, the wind takes the water away too. So, and the dust blows, and the, the water blows, and the dust gets carried out into the neighborhood. Uh, we've been going door to door. We had one community meeting about two weeks ago. We uh, had it in a room 
maybe not quite as big as this, but we expected about 40 people, so we had about 40 chairs. We had over 100 people come out, neighbors coming out, and they were very irate. Uh, a lot of them uh, were, came with their stories about their kids having asthma <clears throat> and uh, uh, kids being sick, uh, not being able to let them out to play in this stuff. Um, we have another community meeting for this Thursday where we have the Illinois EPA coming out to hear uh, more of this because they, they weren't documenting this. And, and for months we were calling the EPA to report this stuff, and they said, well, we're not getting, we're not hearing from the neighborhood. And we said, well, you're hearing from us, believe me, come out here. And it finally took us, we brought our state legislators, uh, our congresswoman, our aldermen, we did two tours, brought them out to see this stuff, and finally began to go door to door to get neighbors and tell them, hey, you have to call, you have to uh, uh, do, keep a log of these things. So there's three little houses across, right across Burley Street on 107th and Burley, across from the entrance to this KCBX, where trucks are coming in and out, around the clock going in and out. Um, and two of those three houses, the people are on respirators. The one gentleman we visited, and he was on Channel 20 News week before last, um, they came out and they did a, a documentary. I'll mention about the dirty face. Where's Jim? He, he asked, yeah. Um, uh, he can't walk from as far as from me to Bill without having his respirator, so he has three of them in his house. And um, he was interviewed, and this uh, Greg King, who did the interview, uh, the next day I talked to him because he asked me to send him some other photos to use in this uh, Channel 20 nine-minute newscast that they did on it, and he kept <coughs> like that <coughs> over the phone, and I said, are you still feeling that because yesterday I had irritation he said he said yeah ever since yesterday because he was out there for two and a half hours doing this taping and he said but you know that it was remarkable when I went home I took a white washcloth and did my face and he said that washcloth was black and these people have this every single day especially on windy days it's worse on some days worse than other days so uh, we, we know that the health effects uh, are, are not good. And what we're looking for is we'd like to see it moved. Detroit had a similar situation in Detroit. They were successful in kicking them out. The uh, Michigan legislature enacted some very strict laws. The mayor of Detroit, uh, we talked to a lot of Detroiters who said he really didn't want to do it, but he with some fanfare, he made it sound like he ordered them away, but uh, David Bing is his name. Uh, whatever they did there, they got rid of them. Uh, Congressman Gary Peters, who's running for the Senate seat of uh, Levin in Michigan, uh, Gary Peters uh, proposed some strong national regulations that is in one of those committees that you talk about, uh, where they like the Rules Committee, it's, it's in Congress. Uh, which is controlled by the Republicans, it's not going anywhere. But um, our Congresswoman Robin Kelly, and this is what uh, Alan or Bill asked about, we'd like to hear about some of the good things that they do from time to time. She jumped on it right away. Her aide came out and took the tour with us and, and he uh, uh, asked the Congressional um, Research Office to research this stuff, to send back a study and uh, she supported, she co-sponsored the legislation, and they're hoping if we can turn, flip Congress next time that they'll be able to get national uh, regulations on this. But meanwhile, we want the city council to do something. We want them to call a hearing, uh, something like they did with the clean, uh, with the um, coal-fired power plants during the, our clean, um, clean power coalition uh, efforts a couple years ago and got the power plants closed down. Um, we're hoping that either they enclose this stuff, but preferably to get it out of Chicago and away from people's homes. So thank you very much, everybody. Hey.